You see this guy right here flying above the waves? This is the most modern interpretation of wave riding. And he's doing that on a bodyboard. You know those polythene boards you saw people riding at your local beach in the early 2000s? And some people would look at them and say, yeah, but that's not a proper surfboard. Well, that statement, yeah, it's completely false. Because the bodyboard is the closest interpretation to the most ancient form of surfing that stretches back to the indigenous Polynesians. And bodyboarders like Hugo Pinheiro are taking the sport to places traditional surfers can't even imagine. We've all heard the origins of football, basketball, and baseball. We followed those sports for decades and across generations. Little do we know though about the origins of extreme sports. Why? Because most of them only rose to fame in the 60s and 70s. And yet these origins can be traced back to eras where these sports were just a way of life or a communal experience. But they all shape these different cultures across the world. So my goal is to explore the communities behind those sports and find out how they've gone on to affect the cultures of today. My name is Andy Burgess. I'm a documentary filmmaker here on YouTube and together with Hugo, we're gonna show you how the sport bodyboarding is one of the most challenging sports and why it means so much to the culture of Hawaii. I have been traveling to Hawaii for 12 or 13 years. The bodyboard changed my life completely and the countless others. That's why it's very important to know the origin of my sport. And along the way, I'm gonna challenge Hugo to ride an ancient board of Hawaii. And in return, he's gonna challenge me to ride a bodyboard on the North Shore of Oahu. I haven't ridden a bodyboard in 10 years. The waves in Hawaii are huge. And the North Shore is home to Pipeline, the most infamous and deadly wave in the world. <laughs> so we'll see how that goes. How would I do riding pipeline? Oh, how many minutes you go underwater? You can handle. 30 seconds maybe? 30 seconds, so dead. Yep, so that's exactly what I was thinking. So we kind of know where this story is gonna end for me, probably not in a good place. But where did this all begin? And why are we in Hawaii? So what do you think of when you think of Hawaii? It's probably surfing. Dudes riding these massive 15 to 30 foot waves, riding them like giants across the ocean with this insane landscape behind them. And yeah, that's kind of right. Before the popularization of surfing in the 1960s, the origins of wave riding was closer to the sport of bodyboarding or boogie boarding as Tom Morley called it in 1971. My perception and knowledge of bodyboarding was like minute. But then when I saw what you were doing on your boards, it blew my mind. Like that is why we're here today. And it just so happens that those boards are tied back to like the ancient history of surfing. Pretty crazy nowadays what uh, the evolution of the sport, you know? Bodyboarding is nowadays such a radical and like extreme sport. So let me give you a little bit of context on why so many extreme sports originated in Polynesia. Hawaii is actually made up of over a hundred islands, but these are the main eight. Although Hawaii is a US state, it's like nowhere else I've seen in America. In fact, like I've never seen anywhere like this in the world. But imagine how the Polynesians that lived here in 400 AD, how did they navigate this island? After traveling thousands of miles to the tip of the Polynesian Triangle in these canoes, and then they had to navigate this insane landscape, these jagged volcanic rocks, these huge cliffs, these vast expanding jungles. That must have been insane, and it was. So navigating by water became a necessary way of them getting around the island, transporting food and goods and people. Wave sliding and ocean activities were a part of the culture, a part of the life. This was our playground, you know what I mean? You, everyone lived by the ocean. It was an integral part. So from the mountain to the sea, it was, a, it was, it was all of, you know, you go up to the very top, like top of the mountain to go pick your tree to make your, your boards and make your papas. When James Cook went into the South Pacific and started to actually document these different cultures and traditions, um, in one of his first journal entries in Tahiti, he looked at a Tahitian catching a wave on a canoe. He made an observation that this individual, as he's riding these waves, 
he's not doing it for anything other than pleasure. You know, that ability to be so connected with an environment, that's a whole nother level of integration into culture. It's hard to estimate, but the academic consensus is that there was around 400,000 native Hawaiians at the time of James Cook's arrival in 1778. And only those at the top of the social hierarchy were able to ride the waves. And within several decades, the majority of the 400,000 natives were wiped out and many other elements of Hawaiian society were lost. But the art of wave riding wasn't lost for long. And things started to change on Waikiki Beach. As more Hawaiians started to take up wave riding again, the Paipo board became a popular board to ride with locals, but they were a much smaller size than the Alaya board and they were ridden pro. They were ridden on your belly. Whoa, that's a pipe, that, that, that's tiny. <laughs> it's a tiny one. Whoa, I want to see you shred on this. Yeah, it'd be crazy. But it's beautiful, huh? It's native, you know, it's what my ancestors did. It's a different type of surfing. It's not like your modern surfing. It's you're more flowing with the water. It just feels way more pure. This is native, locally grown wood, mango and koa, some native koa in here. And you just get your fins and it's like a bodyboard, but made out of wood. <laughs> you know, with the invention of the bodyboard, that just made wave sliding more accessible. In Hawaii, we're very tolerant of all forms of wave riding. Canoes, pipos, alayas, longboards, shortboards, foil boards, boogie boards. I think bodyboarders get their respect here in Hawaii. It doesn't matter what board you ride, as long as you're having fun, you're enjoying the ocean and you care for our ocean, that's the main thing. Even if you have no board, body surfing, it's for everyone. And that's something that I was taught at a very young age. Do you have any advice for him on like riding those foundational boards of the sport? So it, it's, it's a heavier board. The traditional boards compared to our modern boards are night and day. But at the end of the day, feel it out and have fun. You know what I mean? Like surfing's all about having fun. Hugo, oh, wow. how was that? So cool. You were still like riding it like a bodyboard. It was great. Yeah, still ride like a bodyboard, but it's completely, completely different. You can't like do the turns as not as nowadays new boards, but so beautiful, you know, like understand where everything starts. When I start bodyboarding, I just want to have fun, you know, riding small waves. Then we check all the magazines and we see these legends like Kenomiki ripping like pipeline on drop knee. That was crazy to see this and I just dream about like come here one day and uh, see these guys ripping, you know. You know how yesterday Hugo was talking about how Kainoa is sort of this legend in bodyboarding that like legitimized the sport for like people like him around the world. Well, our producer Zach, he knows Kainoa and he's on Oahu now. So we're gonna fly over to Oahu and have these guys meet and just talk about it. I think it's gonna be insane. Hey, brother. Good, good. Good to see you, yeah? I think you were one of the guys that pushed the sport uh, through uh, what is nowadays, you know? You yeah, me? thank you. Yeah, no, thank you. I appreciate it. And that was always my thing. I was surfing pipe by the time I was like 13 or 14 years old. Back then, that was unheard of, much less on a bodyboard. The perception of bodyboarding was just like little Waikiki kind of stuff. They've ne never really seen high performance bodyboarding. And then once the, the surfers were like, okay, they know what they're doing. They're like, you guys got fins on that board? Like, no, they're like, what the <laughs> hell? That's freaking crazy. But still, there's always like that, always had that rivalry. Andy, today I believe that uh, will be the biggest waves you've ever seen in your life. Holy <laughs> <laughs> You just gotta respect her. Yeah, I have to respect her. Oh. Whoa. Like you can hear it from like a mile away. That's what's getting me the most. The sound. Like I grew up skating. That's the closest thing I have to this. And it's like, it's dangerous, but you're putting yourself in that danger. You know what's coming. You're falling off a board, you hurt yourself, something like that. Here, like you have control, but you only have a certain amount. I think all the surfers have a huge respect for 
the ocean, you know. So seeing as the waves at Pipe were too big and choppy for the pros, we decided that we'd head along the coast to try and find somewhere that I could finally ride a bodyboard. Putting some wax in the boards. Surfers put the wax on the hair to get more blondy. You can use like for your hair, you know, I, like have a nice stylish surfing hair. So Andy, this will be your board, okay? And this is your pins. Yeah. This is our normal position in work, and then you just use one arm each sure. time, okay? But when you do that, don't do like this. It's not style, bro. No. Yeah, it's <laughs> some style, okay? It's very important. Okay. I'm confident. I go for yeah. it. So after a quick lesson from a professional, I was feeling pretty confident. I was walking with style like I knew what I was doing. I caught a couple of waves. It was all good. And then I quickly realized why these guys are professionals. This is embarrassing. And that's about the point that I realized I should probably leave this to the pros. Speaking of pros, we couldn't make this video without talking to the nine-time world champion, Mike Stewart. Oh, that's a mouthful. Look at these Andy. This is from Spain. They're actually really light. Once the boards like this were made, what are the sort of the challenges of the sport that put it in like that extreme sport level? Because of the, the refinement in materials, it added new performance capability. You add that to a wave like Pipeline, a lot of parts of that wave hadn't been explored so much, like the lip part of that wave. Yeah. And now this vehicle allowed you access to experience different parts of that wave. Pipe is a, a pretty amazing wave of consequence. It's the most deadly wave. Why bodyboards work so good in those kinds of waves are you can take a steep drop, you can take really hollow conditions where you might have to bend the board in certain ways to uh, accommodate it. Up until that time, no one was really doing that in the waves. So the waves that you saw were probably not as hollow, not as critical, not as gnarly, and guys certainly weren't doing big air moves off of the big lips there. And even to this day, like, it's kind of the domain of bodyboarders. Well, lucky for us, we're sat next to a five-time European champion in bodyboarding. So after seeing Hugo and all these other athletes just killing it on pipe, I can understand why this wave is so incredible. For me, this trip has been so cool. Going to the roots of my sport, hanging out with you and all these legends. It's been really cool to come out here, become friends, and it's then interesting to watch you out on a board as like a professional bodyboarder and like watch you do what you've been doing for 17 years. Final day, Hugo is down on the North Shore surfing pipeline. I'm gonna hike to get a whole view of the North Shore. And we're gonna bring this story to a close. The grass is up to my shoulders. Okay. This will do. We can make this work. Wow. Welcome to what I think is probably the highest point in the North Shore. Where the origins of surfing actually started. These beaches that have been ridden for thousands of years by all types of Hawaiians, all types of boards. It's clear to see the sport of bodyboarding is more than a sport. It's a tight-knit community. Everybody seems to know each other. They all respect one another when they're out in the water. Riding waves may have started in Hawaii, but it's transcended Hawaii. And Hugo, who grew up bodyboarding in Portugal, has the exact same connection to the ocean as the Hawaiian riders of today and of the ancient Polynesians. And I think that's what's really amazing about this sport. It connects everybody together. No matter if you're a beginner, someone who's just ridden a few times like me, or if you're a professional athlete like Hugo. The next time somebody asks me if I want to go out surfing, I'm not just going to assume they're talking about a regular surfboard. It could be an alaya board, a pipo board, a bodyboard. It's all about the connection to the ocean, no matter your ability, from a beginner to a professional. That has fully changed my whole perception on bodyboarding, the perception I had before this. And hopefully, Hugo, the next time I see you, I'll be uh, that much better. And maybe we can ride a wave together in Portugal.
Not Nazareth, but maybe a smaller one.